Over to you, Shohan. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've been reminded again not to go fast, and I always speak fast, so I apologize in advance. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time out of your days to be here um, to listen to the introduction on, on CRP Murchison and also the other projects. Uh, we very much appreciate this opportunity. Uh, my name is uh, Shohan Senevaratna. Um, I'm the CEO of uh, Murchison Hydrogen Renewables on behalf of uh, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners. And I, like many of you, have a background in oil and gas and mining. So I see this as a very apt opportunity uh, towards the latter part of our careers to actually pay a penance or repent for the past sins that we've committed uh, in damaging the environment. So uh, with that, uh, I'll take you to CIP. So uh, Copenhagen, in sorry, legal disclaimer, please don't use this information for investment decisions and so on and so forth. So CIP is the leading renewable energy fund focused on renew or greenfields renewable energy infrastructure investments. Our history dates back to the Danish offshore wind industry, where our founding partners are considered to be the pioneers of Danish offshore wind into the North Sea. We currently have about 18 billion euros of funds under management across nine funds including Fund 4, which is the largest dedicated renewable energy fund, and the ETF fund, uh, which applies to today predominantly, uh, which is the largest, which is globally the largest fund uh, dedicated to clean hydrogen. CIP invests primarily on behalf of um, pension funds, sovereign wealth, and high net wealth family offices. And as a result, we have access to a long stream of patient capital that is able to withstand the long development cycle that we have on projects. And what that really means from a project level is that it enables our projects to really focus on accelerating the project development phase and the de-risking phase without concern over where the funding is coming from. We're also different from a project, from a investment fund point of view in that we obviously are set up to deploy capital on behalf of our investors, but we only deploy that capital in developing our own projects and bringing our own projects to fruition. Currently, CIP has over 20 gigawatts of onshore and offshore wind projects under development and construction, uh, together with approximately three gigawatts of solar, and uh, as well as thermal and transmission. And then that kind of brings us across to this P2X space, uh, which is where the ETF fund comes into play, where we currently have a portfolio of projects distributed in the Americas, Europe, Australia, and the Middle East. Currently, our announced project pipeline sits at about seven gigawatts of electrolysis. And we have a further 20 plus gigawatts of electrolysis in projects that are in the latter stage of assessment uh, within the portfolio, most of which are expected to come into announcement stage in the coming months. So that gives you a, a history and a very brief background into CIP. I'll walk you through ETF. So in order to go through ETF, we still need to understand why is CIP in existence. Yes, we're a fund. Yes, we're there to deploy capital. But ultimately, the fundamental driver that we have as an organization, the backbone of it, is decarbonization and sustainability. That's what CIP has been built on, and that's core to everything that we do. And what we're doing with this PTX and ETF journey is really to carry forward what we have previously done in the offshore and onshore wind industry to be able to continue the decarbonisation journey into the hard to abate sectors such as transport, industry and agriculture. If you see that, um, sorry, looking at the diagram in the middle, what you see is the continuation of electrification alone will only target about 20% of the decarbonisation journey. That remaining 80% is very much related to those hard to abate fossil fuels that need to be replaced. 
And here we've taken a position on green ammonia, green hydrogen and its derivative of green ammonia uh, as a transport medium in the early years uh, to be the source of fuel in order to carry on that decarbonisation journey uh, into the future. I'm going to throw up what is a very, very simple slide. And uh, the reason for this is to try and explain part of the reason why CIP has chosen ammonia. As a technology, the production of ammonia requires renewable electricity, which we've been doing for a long time. It requires the electrolysis of water to produce hydrogen, which is a technology that has been there since the early 1900s. And then finally, the, co the combination or of that hydrogen with atmospheric nitrogen to produce ammonia through the Harbour Bosch process, which has also been there since the early 90s. So what, why has this industry not taken off yet? Well, we don't really have it at scale. The current installed base of electrolysis sits at somewhere around the 300 megawatts. And today you're gonna to hear from projects which are talking about tens of gigawatts of electrolysis in a single project. So there's two main factors. Number one is the industrialization or commercialization of these technologies. And I truly believe that it's going to be a demand and supply. If the demand is there, the supply markets will drive to ensure that we get the scale, that we get the production, that we get the incremental and large improvements that are necessary to make this a reality. The second, of course, is um, with regards to how we manage the intermittency or the variability of renewable power generation with an ammonia production process that is extremely stable or that in history has needed to be very stable. So if you look on the right hand side of that, we see our standard ammonia synthesis loop, which has been around for a long time, operates in a very, very stable pressure based operational philosophy. And we're now going to be applying a highly intermittent renewable power generation profile to drive it, rather than your standard consistent grid power. A lot of projects you'll see these days are looking at either grid power in the form of green or behind the meter um, operations such as ourselves. There has already been significant advancements in ammonia technology with the ammonia licensors around the world that has resulted in higher turndown rates that enable a more flexible ammonia plant. But we're not at a point of having infinite flexibility in ammonia plants, neither with the ammonia plant nor with the associated balance of plant. So therefore, that re the capacity, the reliability of the renewable energy source is extremely important, which is why you'll hear from, Australia, from many of the proponents here in Australia, and all of them, I would say, is that the reason we see Australia as being a strong player in this market is that we have access to one of the best renewable energy resources in the world for the production of green hydrogen and green ammonia. The second phase of this, of course, is electrolysis. <clears throat> electrolysis, currently small scale, but is rapidly being expanded, absorbs probably 70 or more percent of the energy that's required in the green ammonia process. So therefore, having battery power for a buffer, but also having hydrogen buffers downstream of the electrolysis process allows you to have that steady operation of an ammonia synthesis plant. And by combining those factors, we're able to really drive out the costs and drive out uh, the inefficiencies of intermittent or renewable power generation in the production of green ammonia. And this sort of leads to why CIP is taking a portfolio approach. We're strong believers that we're not going to be able to achieve the lowest cost of ammonia or the lowest cost of hydrogen on our first, second and third project. But by having a portfolio approach and being able to learn from our own projects and being able to apply incremental learnings, incremental improvements and standardization into that process, we will be able to ensure that combined with the really strong combined capacity factors of the resource base that we have in Australia to be able to drive some of the lowest cost of green ammonia uh, for export into Korea and into the rest of the world. <clears throat> so that portfolio approach 
in the world of CIP consists of two types of projects. Our domestic projects, which are for domestic offtake, which are generally sub the gigawatt scale, and then our larger gigawatt scale export projects. And I'll talk specifically about Murchison because it's the most apt for the Korean market due to its proximity and due to the project timeline uh, with early production in 28 and full production in 2030. So Murchison Hydrogen Renewables <clears throat> is a six gigawatt power to X project running approximately 2.9, so let's say three gigawatts of electrolysis to deliver 1.9 million tons per annum of green, green ammonia into the market. We primarily see our offtake markets in Korea, Japan, and also um, with some fertilizer manufacturers. We're looking at a timeline that has FID in 2025 with early production in 28 and full COD in 2030. So I guess the, the question from a European company is, why is our flagship project for green hydrogen and green ammonia situated in Australia? And I think I've touched on it a little bit, but I want to go to an arena map um, that was put out, I can't remember what year, but it was a few years ago. And what you see there actually depicts um, comment, I think it was Adam, and I apologize if I get the name wrong, um, mentioned earlier on, is that all, Australia has access to a phenomenal resource quality. Those red and orange areas represent combined capacity factors of wind and solar in excess of 45 and 47 percent, which is extremely high. And what it talks to is the complementarity of the resource between wind and solar. And that is the primary driver for why CIP chose the Murchison Hydrogen Renewables Project to be the flagship for its gigawatt scale projects. But we're only one project, and you're going to hear from many other projects which have access to similarly good resource quality. And as an organization, we want to see all those projects come to fruition, not just ours. In the case of Murchison, this is real live data from 12 months of uh, MetMast information, and it just goes to show you the depth of complementarity that we have between wind and solar. What you see in the green line there is the wind at night complemented by the yellow solar at day to give you an extremely consistent power generation. That's an average over 12 months. There is also some seasonal fluctuation, but the seasonal variation in this region is extremely low, which is also beneficial. The second part of this location, of course, is its proximity to the Asian markets and the easy access to water for desalination uh, to enable the large quantums of water that's required for electrolysis without the need for large transport and also without the need to tap into fresh water streams, which is extremely beneficial when you're looking at trying to produce large quantums of green hydrogen or green ammonia. Thirdly, we do have an extremely supportive government framework in Australia and in Western Australia. We get a lot of support from Minister McTiernan and her team. Uh, we get a lot of support from state, uh, from other state governments, uh, government agencies such as JETSI, uh, DPLH, and also Commonwealth agencies to help drive this into the future. So what I'll leave you with is that's a depiction of what the plant will look like into the future. We're looking at solar in the middle, wind on the outsides, and the plant. But more importantly, I think the main takeaway, particularly for our local Korean audience, is that Australia represents a large opportunity for Korea to trade with in the supply or in the securing of green hydrogen and green ammonia. We're one project. Our success will not be the success of the industry. It's going to take a lot of proponents that you're going to hear from today support from government, but more importantly, drive and demand from large demand sectors like yourselves <clears throat> and the government policies that we're seeing out of Korea, not only to offtake hydrogen and ammonia, but also the work that we've seen from companies like SK Eco Plant, Korea East West Power, POSCO Energy, um, COGAS, Dailim and others to invest in technology around 
this decarbonisation journey, to invest in the cracking technologies, to invest in direct hydrogen and ammonia firing to make this industry a reality so that we can actually leave the planet that we live in in a better place for the future generations that come. Thank you very much. Okay.